G'day, I'm Sean and welcome to the Car Expert Podcast. We've got a very exciting show for you today. We're going to be talking about the new Mustang. It's finally come to Australia and we've finally got some pricing for it. Uh, it's slightly more than you might have hoped for, I guess. Uh, we're going to be talking about the future of Uting in Australia and it's looking slightly electric. And we're going to talk about the uh, mighty Mahindra pickup, the Indian war horse that's here to show the land crews of what's what. But to help me get through all of that, we've brought back at your request, because there was quite a few requests, James James Wong, he's back. Hello, Hello thank you for having me back again. I've made it to round two. Hopefully yes. there's a round three as well. Yes, the commenters uh, <laughs> took your, your little plea to them to heart and they said some nice things and so yeah, you're still here. I am a man of the people, so maybe that's what it is. Yes, it's, I think you're okay as long as you're not like trying to do a drag race, then people are happy to have you around. Yeah, yeah, I think I have to redeem myself with that one. But you can see me beat people in the, I think it was the 4x4 SUV mega test. Yeah, I to did. Be fair, that was against Tony and Paul. It, do, it and doesn't matter. It doesn't <laughs> matter. I'll take oh, a win you, where I can. It doesn't matter whether you win by an inch or a mile, winning's winning, right? Uh, but the man who does often beat Paul in drag races, yes. Scott Colley, he's here as well. I'll teach James a thing or two about how to start at some point. <laughs> yeah, yes. yes, it's go on go is generally the rule that I... Slightly was. before because there's a bit of a lag <laughs> in most of these yes. cars. But so, especially especially Ford Rangers. Yes. Like yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Well, the car that doesn't have too much of a delay uh, is the Mustang when you launch it, but uh, getting it to Australia is probably going to be a bit of a slower thing. Uh, we've been teased with it for a long, long time, but we've finally got pricing. Uh, it is the S650. That's, if you hear that nomenclature, that's what it means. It's the seventh generation, which is yeah. very confusing, but anyway. Uh, um, I'm going to throw it over to Scott because Scott actually went to America and drove the Mustang. Well, it was a while ago. Now you did that. Yeah, mid-year, something like that. So give us a little bit of background on, on what we're expecting because our models are slightly different to the American models. Yeah, so in the States, they have a similar range, but it starts with the EcoBoost, which I think they now call the high performance, but it's a 2.3 litre turbo engine. We've got the GT, which is a 5 litre V8, and then sitting at the top of that range is the Dark Horse. The Dark Horse in the States has 373 kilowatts of power, 567 newton metres. It's got a Tremec gearbox instead of a Getrag one and a whole lot of other track ready stuff. It also comes with the option of a handling pack, which puts front tyres so wide on it, you could honestly use them to level a road. They're incredible. <laughs> uh, in Australia, it's a little bit different. So we are going to get the 2.3 litre, and we're also getting the GT. But our dark horse is slightly less powerful. It's got 349 kilowatts and 548 newton metres. And that's down to slight differences for homologating the exhaust system for Australia. We also don't get the handling pack here. So the dark horse you see is the dark horse you get, with the exception of some exterior styling packages. If you do want the sticky tyres and the extra track stuff, you're going to have to go and talk to Herod Performance and maybe they'll help you out. Mm, yeah, so if you're planning on taking your new Mustang to Cars and Coffee, do do that. That's very important. <laughs> um, so it is worth noting uh, that the price has, has changed quite a lot. Uh, I recall back in 2015, I think the first gen of Mustang we got here yep. came out. Uh, you could get into one for sort of late 40s and you get into a V8 for early 60s. But now the base level, uh, I think EcoBoost or uh, the four cylinder, whatever it's called, the four yeah. cylinders cost about sixty five grand, which is a lot of money. And uh, James, I know you're a fan of a sports coupe, yeah. <laughs> um, but I'm curious what your thoughts are because it's a pretty big price hike over the last generation. Yeah, it was. Um, I was a bit surprised to see just by how much it's gone up, and to see that I think it was the auto. Um, Dark Horse is over $100,000. Yeah, that, yeah. That's a lot of money, especially when, you know, when we covered the Bullet edition of the last one being coming out, it was like 75, and that was very expensive at the time. And a limited edition. Yeah, like, exactly yeah. right. So is the Dark Horse, mind you. Uh, we don't know how limited yet, but there won't be unlimited production of it. Yeah, so I, I found it very interesting, but I guess, you know, we've now been covering years of price rises across the board for so many manufacturers. The new Mustang is quite a significant development over the old one, based on Scott's review, because I haven't driven it. I've, <laughs> I've, barely seen one, have, yeah. Yeah, I've barely seen one in person. So um, it seems like there's a lot of things that have changed and it's a significantly um, better car than the old one, especially when it comes to like handling and stuff, you would say. So I think you know they're sort of now pricing it in the same ballpark as something like a Toyota Supra or you know something along that line, where you know a Supra is a very you know fun track capable car it's got a six cylinder turbo instead of a v8 but you know that the similar levels of performance the same sort of you know attention grabbing designs so it still doesn't really have any competitors that really can do that has the same sort of packaging that it does it's that really big cool american v8 muscle car that you know you can't get a camaro anymore you have to spend a lot more to get a corvette yeah they don't sell the the charger or the challenger here so. i think the other thing worth 
distinguishing here is the difference between starting price and the actual price people paid for the last Mustang. I know prices went up with the facelift, they've gone up again, but there were a lot of options on, especially the facelifted Mustang previously. I know the GT, you could pay more for a wing and bigger wheels and then the Magneto. Magneto the suspension, dampers, yeah. yeah. So I know it started at about 70 grand, but by the time you put all the options on it, you could spend 80 grand, 85 grand on a V8 Mustang. And what we've seen from a lot of car brands is they've realized that Aussies, when it comes to cars like this, they're not messing around with entry level models. They just want the best because it is an emotional purchase. So I think the other thing worth considering here is when you compare top spec old versus top spec new, it's still more expensive, but the, this base price jumping thing is less relevant to a lot of buyers because this is a car they're buying for fun and for the sake of it and they just want the lot on there. I recall Mercedes a few years ago saying that their, their largest C63 AMG sales were uh, like per capita was actually Australia. Um, and Aussies would buy more of those over base level C classes. And the reason I bring that up is because the power output of this car is not that dissimilar to what the previous gen V8 uh, C63 was, but it is a damn lick cheaper. But I'm curious, um, is it worth the extra money over the previous one? Because it's got a new interior, which you know you could, I could take or leave personally. It's got new styling, uh, but the power outputs are not that significant. So to you guys, would you think that it's worth an extra 12 or 15 grand over what the last one was? I'd probably have to reserve my judgment until I drive it. Um, because yeah, if it's as good as Scott said it was in the international launch review, I would say that you know for a lot of people it might be. Um, but yeah, I probably can't speak to it the way you can? I'm going to say yes. Um, I think the last Mustang, I love the way it drove, especially after the update, but the interior really let it down. Um, it looked very cool and retro, but as soon as you poke beneath the surface, it just felt cheap and nasty. This new one's still not an S-Class, but the combination of like new school tech and old school design and feel is really good in the American cars we drove. And I think also the dark horse with all the track-ready stuff you've got on it is kind of going to cost the same as what people might have been doing to their GT anyway if they wanted to add differential coolers, extra cooling for the engine, transmission, that sort of thing. So I actually think Ford's right in the right spot with it. And I think regardless of what they charge for it, they could have probably put 20 grand more on the price and people still would have bought them. I so mean, people are still going to rush it and buy a Rash supercharger and put it on exactly. there anyway. But, um, I, I guess it, it brings up another question. Um, do you think the budget-friendly sports car is on the way out in Australia? I mean, I know there's MX-5s and there's Toyota 86s, but... They're not that cheap either anymore, They're not that they? cheap and they're not that sporty when you actually... Like, when you look at something like this with the big power and everything, they're very low-powered and they're fun, but I wouldn't say they're sports cars per se. I think you ha it depends on how you define a sports car because I would argue a Hyundai i20N for 35-odd grand, you can't get the Fiesta ST anymore, but that is absolutely a sports car. It's absolutely affordable and it's got a long warranty that lasts on the track. I think also the 86 and the BRZ, they're not sports cars in the same way a V8 Commodore was, but they are absolutely sports cars that make you feel special, that encourage you to go for a drive. So I don't think the concept's completely dead. I just think like everything else we talk about on this podcast, we need to move the goalpost a little bit. I mean, a base Toyota Yaris is now 25 grand, so you can't expect to be able to get a basic sports car for the same money. It's gonna move in line with the rest of the market. Where do you stand, James? As the owner of a Golf GTI. <laughs> yeah. Is James not, Golf not that GTI? anyone knows. <laughs> yeah, I don't he's, talk mentioned, about it. he's mentioned it to me once or twice. Yeah, just, um, just quietly. But again, like that, and, it, and that's the case of another, I guess, like sporty car now costing an absolute fortune. Like, where do you stand on it? Yeah, I think, like Scott said, I think it's more the definition of what is affordable as opposed to what's an attainable sports car or anything like that. I think a lot of, you know, I think of when I was getting my license and the kind of money that people or kids were spending on their first cars or what their parents were giving them to spend on their first cars versus what they're getting now and it's a completely different ball game and you know you can get even though the, the entry prices are, are creeping up or not creeping up they're jumping up these mm. days but you know even a, a base mx5 of the new range the two liter 40 grand you can get it with a manual like that's a really great sports car and for a lot of people that's within reach in terms of you know people finance these days all that kind of stuff and like scott said the 86 and the brz are there as well when it comes to hot hatches yeah they're slowly creeping up too because as tech gets more refined um, a lot of those cars are based on you know conventional passenger cars that need to move with the times and that's why they continue to get more expensive but i think what's more disappointing is just the the actual 
actual options mm. are disappearing as opposed to the price bracket because, you know, you look at Ford's now exited both the Fiesta and Focus segments with their cars. We've seen um, various other models be pulled from the Australian market because of low volume or for whatever reason. And it's, um, it's just a shame that we're seeing less of that because, yeah, like you said, people will buy the Mustang anyway. There'll be people that buy the high performance or the, the four-cylinder one. There'll be people that buy the GT and the Dark Horse regardless of the price bracket. We've seen that with um, numerous other model lines that have crept up in price as well. So I guess, yeah, it's a shame that you can't get into one for much cheaper, but that's what the second-hand market's for now, I guess. And if you're looking around on the second-hand market, I know we're a new car website and a new car podcast, but my God, there's some good cheap French hot hatches out there that you could buy as a first car and have so much fun yeah. with. I mean, if you want to learn to be a mechanic, it's probably the perfect <laughs> car that's too. I guess, look, the Mustang, it's looking like it's about 100 grand. Um, it's still the perfect midlife crisis car because it's a lot cheaper than a Porsche Boxster. <laughs> it is, <laughs> so, uh, Yeah, I think you're right. People will probably buy it. I'm curious, one last question before we move on from the yeah. Mustang. Uh, the looks. Where do you guys stand on... And I think I know where you stand on it, Scott, but I'm gonna, I'll am gonna. i ask you anyway. Yeah, I wasn't sold on it in the pictures. It looks a little bit droopy and sad, but in person, I think Ford's done an awesome job modernising the design. I actually think the Dark Horse with its sort of Kiss face paint on it I'm less of a fan of, but I've seen a couple of GTs and in bright colours, they look really crisp and nice. So wait until you see it in person and then we'll, we'll talk. What about you, James? Yeah, I was sort of the same. I think the, the last one was really sleek and, and, you know, the rounded edges, I prefer that kind of design. The, the new one's quite squared off and it's a little bit polarising in images. I have seen one in person. There was a, a person from Ford that brought a, a yellow GT to a drive day that I went to. And it looked nice but a little bit plain um, in that sort of bright yellow that they have for the last one. So I'd be interested to see how it looks in other colours and with different variants to see how, you know, a different coloured wheel or a spoiler or something make changes the look in person so I'll wait and see. Cool well we will have more Mustang news in the future and uh, as, the, as soon as we can get our hands on one we will uh, take it for a drive and let you know how it is so make sure you subscribe for that. Uh, any, are you buying a Mustang? Leave a comment let us know we'd love to know. Um, but something you uh, another future thing that we're looking at today is the electrification of the ute market. Now there's a couple of cars already that you can get that have some sort of electrification. Uh, LDV sell the T60E, I think the they call it. E T60E, yes. yes, phone home. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, terrible range, uh, can't tow, can't take a load, and costs about 100 grand. It's yeah, not very really... much a, a fleet or a local council special. That yeah, one. yeah, it's not what we're hoping for when it comes to electric utes, but it's a start. It's yeah. a start. Um, but this has all come about because Hyundai I have suggested or, or they've confirmed that an electrified Ranger rival is coming to Australia. So, uh, James, what can you tell us about that? Well, I don't think they've actually given us too much other than that it's coming, <laughs> yeah. right? Like the, the Hyundai and the Kia Ute, which are apparently two different things, um, have been spoken about for a very long time. There's been rumours. I know that um, the, the two brands are very keen to get in on the segment here because obviously our top two selling vehicles in the country are Utes. And um, I think they've, they've sort of danced around a lot of the details. The Hyundai one's meant to have some sort of electrification. We're not sure if it's going to be full electric, a hybrid, a plug-in hybrid or whatever. And, you know, as you know, as you just said as well, that the, the electrification within the dual cab ute segment has been very slow. Um, I think the ET60 is a prime example of how it's very difficult to bring something to market with the correct capabilities that a lot of people expect of those vehicles. And, you know, the first mainstream attempt you could consider the mild hybrid Hilux, but that's hardly a proper hybrid. I think Ranger plug-in hybrid's probably more the... Yeah. Exactly the right. There. And that's still over a year away. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's there's not really much that we can say. You know, in America, they have some all-electric utes. You've got things like the F-150 Lightning, the Rivian. But even then, the, 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 the hard thing with an electric drivetrain in something like a dual-cab ute is maintaining the level of capability and, you know, um, ruggedness that those cars are known for, while also being able to have balance that with a battery pack that offers a substantial amount of range. Because, you know, you think of Australia, people buy utes to tow caravans or to go camping, and that normally means going somewhere far away and remote. I do think Hyundai's at an advantage on that front, though. If you are Ford and you're building an electric F-150, there are genuinely 75 or 100 years worth of F-150 owners that go, well, my truck's always done this, it needs to do this again. Yeah. Hyundai has built commercial vehicles before, but it hasn't built a ute that sells in the Ranger segment in Australia. No one really knows what it needs to be, and I think that means Hyundai can define it for itself in a way that other brands can't. So 
I think Hyundai's got the advantage of being able to rock up to the segment and rather than saying, hey, this is just as good as your Ranger, we promise we don't want to upset you, it can just say, this is what our ute does. It's a lifestyle ute. It's designed to take your dirt bike to the beach or tow your jet ski from home to the waterfront or whatever it is. Maybe it's aimed at people who want to plug in on the campsite, something like that. They can really set the boundaries for it in a way that other brands aren't able to. And I think that's a huge advantage and something we've seen from Rivian as well in the States, which yeah. has been able to chart its own path instead of having to kind of adapt historical utes for the electric age. But I still feel like Rivian has a level of capability that yeah. is expected of cars in that yeah, segment. Definitely. And, you know, you think of America and Australia, the, the truck buyers want a truck. They want something that can do those things, even if they're never going to do them. Mm. There are plenty of people that say, I need three and a half tonne towing capacity, <laughs> but I'm towing a box trailer that's 800 kilos or a jet ski. Yeah. So I think they still there still needs to be a level of capability that caters to that market mm. because the Ultimately, Hyundai will be trying to cash in on buyers and owners that are from other brands. And they have to try and bring you in with something unique, which, you know, this electrified drivetrain might, but they still need to maintain, I think, what people expect of a vehicle in that segment. I do want to talk about the range of FEV, and I don't want this to become a Ford podcast, but uh, I think it is imp a really important step in the, like, the electrification of the ute market. Um, a plug-in hybrid ute makes a lot more sense than a fully electric ute at this stage with battery technology. Um, the, the Ranger's FEV sounds really cool because it's going to have the EcoBoost engine that's in the Amarok, yep. the petrol one. And in the Mustang. And in the Mustang, so it, it, we already know it goes like stink, and then it's going to have that power boost. So yep. it should be capable of towing three and a half tonne. Obviously, there'll be some weight uh, restrictions in that, but uh, in theory, it should be capable of that. It should still be capable of taking a load in the back, uh, and you can actually use it as like electrification at your campsite or on your work site. And I think, um, if, I feel like Ford are sort of more on the money at this stage of the game with, when it comes to electrifying a ute. What do you guys think? I'm actually not so sure. Uh, and the reason is partly that that Ranger plug-in hybrid is a play that I think has been driven by Ford of Europe. Uh, Ford Australia, when it made this announcement, did it in conjunction with Ford of Europe. And if you look at European emissions rules, when you want to sell cars over there, you need to be below a certain fleet average and plug-in hybrids are a great way of dragging emissions down without spending too much on batteries. I think also if you, if you look at how people use these utes, if you are driving a short enough distance regularly enough that you only use the electric motor, it doesn't really make any sense to have the petrol engine there anyway. And the flip side of that is if you are constantly towing long distances or doing big heavy loads, the electric motor is not going to get you very far. It might get you 10 k's and then you're on the petrol engine anyway, at which point maybe a diesel is more efficient. So it's going to come down to how Ford tunes it, obviously. But like with a lot of plug-in hybrids, I do feel like there is a risk that the weight and complexity and cost that comes with this plug-in hybrid system doesn't give you a better car. It gives you a car that's slightly worse at being electric and slightly worse at being petrol or diesel than a dedicated version of either. I'm going to counter you, and I know you're meant to be the car expert here, but <laughs> I do want to say as a, as a, a long-term ute owner, yeah. I think the thing that about the utes and the pickup trucks and the people that buy them is it's, it's an idealism that they... That's the reason they buy it. They buy it for the idea and the opportunity that they can go out and do anything and conquer yeah. any terrain. I think that's why the Range of Fev, I think, will do really well mm. because it's it's selling a dream. Uh, it's, selling, it's selling an ideal that... It, Look, most of them might not ever have to drive far enough to ever turn on the petrol engine. And yes, it probably won't do that well towing, but it does always have that, it maintains a little bit of power yeah, for it'll electric be able boost. To boost itself. But I think it, it still fits that brief that the ute buyers want. Yeah. And I think if, if people bought utes based on the idea of like this, a fit for purpose thing, they'd yeah. all be driving workmate Hiluxes. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, but people all buy, like the biggest sellers are Wildtrack and a, mm. a, a, a SR5 or yeah. whatever. So just to counter you a little bit on that. Oh, I, I don't disagree with you that, I, that it'll sell and there'll be interest in it. Whether or not that's actually justified by the product is another question. I suppose that's for us to find out when we get to drive it. And I'm curious, this one is very much, uh, we don't have any, any evidence really. We don't have any information, but BYD are working on yeah. Uh, you, and I, I'm not sure which one of you knows more about it or wants to say something. I'm going to handball that to James. Yeah. So I know very little about it. It's, yeah. it's, I, so far, all we've seen is renders, basically. Yeah. But yeah. Well, I think what what you can what we know about BYD is that they're obviously an electric car giant. They've been working on like you know a def they've revealed like a Land Rover Defender G Wagon mm. competitor that's all electric, has massive power, huge capabilities, and so I think you know they've got the tech that's available to them and the know-how about how to make a vehicle like that that can do these things. 
um, whether it actually comes to fruition and is competitive in terms of price. You know, their, their pricing is really good at the moment. You, all the stuff that that's come to market, they've been able to beat Tesla at their own game in terms of positioning. Um, but yeah, like you said, it's very early days about a Ute to be like, yeah, that's going to come here and do things. But people are really open to the Chinese brands now. You see, you know, in our comments, people are buying them. People say, you know, I'm open to Chinese brands. If the Europeans were complaining about it at the moment about them coming in too cheap, they're like, bring them here, we'll buy them. So I think um, it'll be a really interesting interesting thing to see all these new brands and new models coming to shake up, you know, what is a very brand and, and, and nameplate led segment because people buy Hiluxes because they don't break, right? Same with Rangers. People love Rangers because they're tough, they're, they look cool and there's a, there's a brand around that. So um, when these new players come in, it'll definitely be very interesting. I don't want to go too far off topic here, but you just mentioned something about um, the Europeans panicking a little bit about the Chinese uh, influx of Chinese cars in Europe. And I, I just, like, I really hope that Europe handles it better than Australia did. And I know that wasn't Chinese cars that caused the manufacturing to cease here, but the way that Australia handled the influx of overseas cars at, at better prices and better build qualities with luxury car tax and all that sort of, all the sort of things they did, it sort of screwed us in the, in the long run. And now we're still stuck with the luxury car tax and a whole bunch of legacy effects because of that. And I, I truly, truly hope Europe handles that a lot better than we did. I think Europe has the advantage of for one government that is very linked to the unions and all of these car makers are union manufacturers. So you look at the, the plants in France, in Germany, those workforces are very heavily protected in a way the Australian workforce wasn't. I think the other thing is building cars in Australia was something that made us really proud as car people. But a lot of Australians didn't care after quite a while because we moved from a manufacturing nation to a more modern, high-tech, knowledge-based nation. That's how we like to see ourselves anyway, I would argue. Um, a lot of you know, people in Germany, in France, in parts of Europe that do manufacture cars are incredibly proud of the fact that that is what they do. And it's sort of a national export of, of note in a way that cars just weren't in Australia. So I think that national pride is going to play a role as well. Well, Elizabeth is often called the Stuttgart of Adelaide, so... You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> people, people who worked at Holden. As, what, as opposed to Handorf, the actual German town just outside Adelaide. Okay. If I can quickly jump in here as yeah, well, yeah, I think absolutely. the difference between Australia and Europe as well is that in Australia and probably in, in the US as well, that importing cars is desirable. Mm. Foreign vehicles are desirable here. And that actually was another big player in the death of local manufacturing because, you know, once the Europeans could bring in really nice stuff for about the same price as a high-spec Holden or Ford, people were like, well... I want a C-Class. I want a C-Class. Yeah, I want a Golf. A, a Golf or a 3 <laughs> Series or whatever. And the local manufacturers couldn't compete because they couldn't develop the tech and the platforms in time. I think what's different about Europe is that they, their own cars in-house are what they desire. You don't see... Like, I, we've all been to Europe you've been to it recently as well everything's european so to see a mazda on the road is you know wow what you notice it because it's there or you know something something asian or american it's very unusual to see a non-european brand there um so i think that for them it's more about um managing that the price thing that they're complaining about now as opposed to you know people jumping ship and then you know volkswagen shuts its doors tomorrow sort of thing i don't think that's going to happen yeah i don't want to drag this out too far i realize we've got to move on but i think the last thing on that is that the chinese brands i know that they're a bit bullish at the moment and they're trying to establish themselves but there is immense respect in china for overseas brands tesla is massive in china american brands have a good reputation in china European brands have a good reputation in China, which is why we've seen them pair up on all sorts of joint ventures outside of China where you don't necessarily have to do it. I think that there is going to be a power shift to China, regardless of what Europe tries to do it. We're just seeing it with the supply chain and the, the sheer scale of what they're doing. But I don't know that that's going to mean death or trouble for the European brands in the long term. It's going to mean funding. It's going to mean partnerships and things that allow them to build creative, interesting cars in a way maybe they can't at the moment. So... If it is managed right, I think the future is pretty bright. BYD Aldi. Build your dreams Aldi. That sounds good, right? Sure, we'll go with that. <laughs> the uh, Atto RS6. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, know, uh, you never know. Who knows? The MG4 GTI. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Um, that's not confirmed, so we'll uh, move on. Uh, look, uh, I'm, I, this is the time where we normally do the uh, Help Me Car Expert plug, and we're going to just change it up a little bit today because um, we've got... Uh, a big list of dealers that help us out and that we can connect you with when buying a car. Um, but one of the things that they've recently started providing us is cars that have short wait times. Mm. So one thing I wanted to ask you guys, Rangers have a ridiculous wait time at the moment, especially if you want like top spec V6. Yeah. Um, I wanna know, 
So both of you, what would you buy uh, as an alternative that doesn't have a very long wait time? Scott, I'll start with you. I'm going to go Isuzu D-Max. Good call. Uh, I like the D-Max not because it is the best ute, because I think the Ranger is the best ute, but the D-Max is a really good all-rounder. It's really nice and comfy. And I, I quite like the way it looks for the money as well in X-Terrain spec. Uh, I think also you can actually get one at the moment because Isuzu has really improved its stock situation. There is a facelift coming, but it won't be till next year, late potentially. So you're not missing out on too much at the moment. And James, what about you? I think my first thing was to say Amarok, but I think the V6s have a similar <laughs> sort of situation. Similar so, Although um, they do come from two different places, which I find very interesting, yeah. but anyway. Yeah, um, so I think my first pick, if it's not the Ranger or the Amarok, so it's not technically my first, first pick is my third maybe, but um, the Mazda BT-50. So basically yep. Yep. echoing Scott's um, reasons for choosing the <laughs> D-Max because they're basically the same car, but I actually prefer the look of the um, BT-50. I think it's a bit classier, and I was the kind of person that liked the look of the old Mercedes X-Class because it looked really nice. Um, regardless so of what you, it was you actually were the able one. to do. <laughs> yeah, I was the one person that, that was buying one. Um, but yeah, I really like the, the BT50 and I have spent plenty of time in it. And for the same reason, Scott, they're very comfy. There's plenty of tech and, um, you know, it's a little bit, not quite uh, as comfortable as a Ranger and Amarok in terms of, you know, on-road feel, but it's definitely competitive and they're fairly affordable by mm. comparison. So, yeah. Well, if you're interested in either one of those, uh, we can help connect you to a dealer to get into one of those quicker than you might think. Head to Google, type in Help Me Car Expert. You can help you find your car, connect to a dealer, and we'll get you in one sooner than you might think, or definitely sooner than you can get into a Ranger. Uh, so yeah, Google Help Me Car Expert, and uh, let us know. If you use the service, how was it? Leave a comment, we'd love to know. All right, it's time. I'm very excited to talk about this one because this is um, one of the more exciting utes you can actually buy. <laughs> I, and hear me out on you this. You are a farm boy at it, heart, aren't you? I, I, it is, it is. The Mahindra pickup, the might of India is, is here. <laughs> um, and before you laugh and go, oh, well, that, they're not gonna last very long, uh, Mahindra is the biggest automotive manufacturer in the world, and they've been making tractors since the 40s. Mm -hmm. So they know a thing or two about making a tough uh, workhorse. Um, but uh, this is a little bit, uh, it, it looks odd to people, I guess. Uh, and I'll, I'll throw it straight out to you guys. What do you think of the looks of the Mahindra pickup? I think if you're worried about how it looks, you're missing the point, is probably the best way I can <laughs> say it. There you go. Yep. James, what do you think? Um, it looks the same as it has for a long time. Yep. Uh, which, funnily enough, <laughs> this, is, this is some diplomacy yes. going on right now. Um, the bitter irony is the people that all say, oh, it looks silly and it won't last, the people that have been buying the same Land Cruiser for 70 years. Yes. Uh, which, honestly, this thing competes with, um, not on price, because it, you could buy two of them for the price of a 70 series, but in terms of its capabilities, it is, it is extraordinarily capable, and it starts at 40 grand. Oh, it costs about 40 grand. So 40 grand size. drive away yeah. for the dual cab work pack that we tested, which comes with a bull bar, a snorkel, and a stainless steel tray. Which you do not get any of on an $80,000 Land Cruiser. Uh, when I say stainless steel, I think I mean aluminium. It's I'm aluminium, sorry. Yeah, yeah. A very solid tray, a stainless steel one. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's not a Land Cruiser 70. Uh, I think if I were going to tow a boat through the Simpson Desert, maybe, I don't know why, why I do. Why so <laughs> Mate, that's, that's what happened to Burke and Wills and it didn't end well for them. I sort of mixed my metaphors there. <laughs> Crossing the Simpson Desert and towing a boat are the two things that people talk I about I with you. I see jet skis in the Gobi Desert <laughs> yes. too. Yeah. Are you doing like a logistics for like an art pop-up or something? Yeah. It's like, here's a boat in the sandy yeah. desert. Australia's remotest <laughs> uh, beaching. Yes, anyway. Um, if I were towing a, a big caravan through the Simpson Desert, I'd still want the Land Cruiser 70. But the Mahindra does a very similar thing in that it is incredibly re reliable, it's incredibly low frills, and I spent most of my time driving it in the city where it's not all that happy. It's got a big turning circle. It's pretty uncomfortable at the back. It's about the size of Jupiter. <laughs> the two, yeah. I, my girlfriend and I went out to a movie um, on the Friday night. We had the car. Did she steal I, your girlfriend yeah, after it? <laughs> yeah, she is. <laughs> The relationship ran its course in the time it took to do a year. Yeah. <laughs> Genuinely, though, we, we pulled into this sort of narrow parking bay got to the end and went, oh, there's no spot there. And I, I couldn't get out. I couldn't reverse because there was a car waiting. And I had to do an Austin Powers turn <laughs> to get out. Maisie had to get out of the car and actually tell me what was at the back because the reversing camera's on a 45 degree angle. And, and twisted and down. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a look, but that was a little bit odd. It's not the point of that truck. And when we take it off road, which we've done in our video of it, Mahindras are always incredibly capable. Uh, it got up all sorts of stuff with two wheel drive activated where other cars struggle with four-wheel drive. Um, we know that the mechanicals underneath are incredibly reliable because it's designed to be an Indian farm ute that's sold alongside tractors. So I think viewed through that lens, 
Yeah, you crush up with a Land Cruiser 7 if you wanted to. Well, I mean, if you're, a, if you're a, a running a, a big station and you normally would go out and buy a couple of Land Cruisers every year for the farmhands to drive around, why would you... Why, like, this... Well, if you're going to give it to a 17-year-old ringer, uh, I'd much rather him in a $40,000 car than a $80,000 car because he's just going to trash it and smoke Winfield Rollies in it anyway. So, um, I think <laughs> he it's just a spoke different... a different language there. <laughs> <laughs> that was not so, to all my country brethren, I hope you understood. Um, but look, it's it's not what you call the most powerful thing in the world. It's 100 odd kilowatts, 320 newton meters. But did you actually get a drive off it, James, when it was here? Not not of this one. I have driven one in the past, and. Um... Yeah, I didn't get to drive this one. <laughs> <laughs> but you've, you've driven one in the past. Did you drive the manual or the automatic in the past? It was a manual. Yeah, see, yeah. now I think that's the pick, but you can't get one anymore, which is really disappointing. But what did you think of it anyway? Because it hasn't changed that much apart from the gearbox. It felt like a truck. Like, yeah, I think that it's a very rugged, old-school thing. And it, actually, to be honest, it's the same thoughts I had about the 70 Series. Is You know, the 70 Series is marketed as this big, you know, cool thing that everyone wants to buy. But it's actually live with. There's not anything particularly special from a refinement or comfort perspective. So, you know, it's a very... Uh, it's a specialist fit-for-purpose vehicle. And, and it's an interesting conversation around, you know, who, who would you recommend it to? Or, you know, do you spend the money on a, a Land Cruiser 70? I guess for some people, having a five-star and cap rate, uh, safety rating is really important the Land Cruiser has that um, but for s s beating around a paddock or you know you're you live regionally and you're just going to town every now and then to pick up something but you need the tray for other stuff whether you, you know with your livestock or whatever it is farm people do you know it, it, <laughs> it's it, you know, it's perfectly fine for that and you can save yourself a lot of money yeah, well, it's interesting because 90 odd years ago, uh, a farmer's wife wrote to Ford of Australia and said, I need a car that can go to church on Sunday, take the sheep to farmer's markets on a Monday. And this is absolutely fits the bill of the ute because it really does. So I'm curious, uh, you guys, we're going we're gonna to keep this one quite short because I'd much rather people actually go and watch our review because it's Paul uh, drove it at the Proving Ground and it is it's a really fun review. It's a fun little car. So go and check it out. But uh, buy or pass, what would you go with this one? I don't have a farm and I will therefore pass. But if you did have a farm... I would definitely consider it, uh, given the choice between that and either a very old Land Cruiser 70 or even a, a pretty basic, you know, two-wheel drive D-Max BT50 Ranger. I think the Mahindra will probably do more and there is something very charming about how rugged it is. James? Yeah, I think if I, if, it was, if I had the purpose for it, it would be something I'd consider, for sure, rather than, you know, spending twice as much on something else. Um, I think it, yeah, it definitely is a very specialised thing that if it fits your requirements and you don't want to be too flashy about it, it definitely has a, has a place. Cool. Well, if you own a Mahindra uh, and if you bought or if you've ordered a pickup, uh, leave a comment and let us know what you're excited about and what colour because they come with uh, a fun range of colours on like a lot of... Uh, yeah, if you put a red pickup, please yeah, call us. Let us, let, <laughs> let us know. Um, all right, guys. Time for our picks of the week. Uh, I'm going to throw over to James first. What have you got this week, mate? So I spend a lot of time on social media. And, um, <laughs> I, and Scott will know that I send him stupid reels all the time. And I came across this lady who was, I think she's doing a car review or some sort of marketing thing. But it's, she's, it's insane if that's what she's trying yeah, to do. Yeah, it's, it's in Mandarin, so I can't understand what she's saying. But she does this thing where she's talking about the car, but she runs up to it and jumps into either an open door, a boot, or on top of the bonnet. Is this and like it's, the Bentley thing all over again? Well, it's, it's, similar, yeah. it's sort okay. of like that, because there's a, the, the video that I found is a guy that stitched his version of it jumping oh. into his own car, and I just found it so funny, and I had no idea what was going on. It's scary, though. Like, she, she runs up to the open boot of this Audi A6 and launches herself into it, feet first, but I'm just watching that going, I'd be hitting my head. I don't know what you're doing to the car. It, it's yeah. weird. Well, your feet would be sticking out the other end, to be fair. Yeah, I know the seat's folded. <laughs> <laughs> you'd be putting your head out the back and toes out the front. <laughs> but us, us normal people would probably you'd fit You'd be in. fine. <laughs> All right, Scott, what's your pick this week? Um, I've gone a, a video by Johnny Smith, who people will know from the Late Break show uh, and also from Fifth Gear back in the day with the mutton chops. Um, and he drove the Volkswagen XL1 which is from a different era at Volkswagen entirely. It's essentially the Bugatti Veyron of hypermiling. They targeted one litre per 100 kilometres fuel economy and built this incredible supercar looking thing with flip up gull wing doors, but a really lightweight stripped out interior. It's a fascinating look at a different time in the motoring world where electric cars weren't really a thing and, and brands were really focused on what's the most extreme way we can hypermile. I also really enjoy Johnny Smith as a presenter. I think he's really passionate and knowledgeable and I did love him going into the details, actually driving the car and kind of just showing off what I think is 
probably forgotten on the back of Dieselgate, but also the incredible technological achievement that is the Veyron. Mm. And did it reach one litre per 100 kilometres? It actually exceeded that, I wow. think. So they were targeting something crazy like 240 US miles per gallon. I think they ended up getting 250. Wow. Uh, it is a really incredible piece of engineering. That's impressive. That is a cheap car to run, but probably not to buy. Not to buy anymore, <laughs> no. Well, uh, my pick this week is actually a bit of shameless self-promotion. Um, <laughs> Uh, recently, we did a trip from Melbourne to the Bend in a couple of Porsche GT3 RSs. Uh, Paul and Albers drove them, and Igor and I went along to film it, and we spent the few days in a Porsche Cayenne oh, S. lovely. It was a very hard trip. Um, Igor and I really <laughs> suffered through that, especially there was a cold morning where we had to put the heated seats on. But oh, on full, though. No, it, was no. on, it was on full, yeah. Um, but no, the, the point is that that trip was really fun, and those cars are absolutely phenomenal. And what's been really cool, so uh, click up here if you want to watch it, because this is a really fun video, so I do encourage you to check it out. Uh, and we'll put a link in the description, or if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Um, but what I've seen since then is just so much Porsche GT3 RS content coming out. I saw Top Gear did a thing where it's just slow motion drifting of a GT3 RS. Um, yeah, it's, it's, they're popping up everywhere and they are just so freaking cool. <laughs> like I, I, was, I thought it was cool before, but I am genuinely in love with those cars now. You don't need to tell me twice. Yeah, Porsche know, yeah. 911 GT3 is my dream car. Yeah. So. Yeah, where do you stand on it, James? You you drive a, a Golf. It's sort of similar. It's sort of related. I, I do actually say I drive the People's 911. Yes. <laughs> yes. If you in um, reverse, it I was is. Gonna <laughs> say, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, I think I've never really been as fascinated uh, with Porsches as someone like Scott. I've always found like especially the the lower grade ones a bit boring. And you know, obviously, there's that joke that you know every generation is the same as last year to the point where you could call it a Beetle, which is obviously offensive too. <laughs> <laughs> the amount of work that goes into engineering these cars. Yeah, but the Beetle works really hard. Okay, it nice does, it does. Um, but yeah, I think when you get to that level of like the turbo or the GT3 where the, the capabilities of a car that is, you know, somewhat attainable for a, a privileged few, but it, the, the kind of things that they can do and, you know, the way that Albors described it on track, for example, was just, it was, it was incredible. And I've not, I'm still yet to experience one fully, so um, please send me on a launch. Um, <laughs> but I, the, the way that those cars sound, the, the capability that's, you know, so close to a motor, like a proper race car and just how they look, they look mm, fantastic. Wild. I, yeah, I Especially think was, the colours in the GT3 oh. Well, I think today I saw a, a GT3 Touring on the freeway that was in like Kermit Green with bronze oh, wheels. And I was like, do you know what? I could drive one. Yeah, it works. <laughs> it works. Yeah. Somehow it works. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think now Porsche has really caught on to how if you make it look a little bit cooler and a little bit more distinctive, yeah. people pay attention. And now that they're so fat with the stupid wings and the, the contrast decals, like they really have a presence now. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a, you know, a beetle. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Well, um, yeah, look, my pick is just GT3 RSs, basically. <laughs> uh, look, uh, next week we're going to be taking a little bit of a break. We're, we're all away with a whole heap of stuff on, so we're just going to have a week off the podcast. Feel free to head back in the library and listen to some of the earlier ones because there's some absolute crackers in there. What are you actually doing with your time? I'm playing golf <laughs> on my day off. Yes, uh, I'm visiting my mum. There you uh, go. <laughs> and, uh, actually, James will be here working, but, um, you know, we, we didn't want to leave him on his own. So, yeah, <laughs> uh, we'll be back the following week, so make sure you're subscribed. Uh, click that like and leave us a comment if you have any questions or feedback because we love to answer questions but we haven't been getting many lately so please leave a couple of questions so we can actually answer them for you but guys thank you for joining me once again at another lovely cloudy day in melbourne here <laughs> we're hoping as we get to summer we've got some nice days so we can get out in some nice cars and do some nice drives uh and, and uh, just quickly uh any nice cars you have your eye on to drive over the summer I am very excited to experience the new Audi RS6. I've been, uh, who wouldn't be? Right. <laughs> it's just touched down in Australia. I just got an email about it. This is why I'm thinking of this. But it was mind-blowing to me, the last one I drove. So if there is a set of keys going around for one of those, even for a day, I'm very much looking forward to having a spin. What about you, James? You got anything you've got your eye on? Uh, I'm just trying to think of... New what, golf, probably. Well, I do a lot of the booking, so I've been trying to figure out what, what, what we've got. But um, Maybe a Mahindra pickup. Yeah, maybe a Mahindra pickup. We also, I also booked in an MX-5 for the team over summer, and okay. something about uh, the MX-5 in summer with the roof down is just really, really with cool. With your hair, definitely. Oh, well, exactly yeah. right. Yeah. You know, Not with mine. I don't have enough. Uh, I can't afford to have the wind down. Yeah, I need you guys with the camera following me everywhere <laughs> so you can just see it coming out the, the top of the roof. But, um, yeah, it, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that kind of stuff, to be honest. I'm going to throw 
throw one more in the mix, sorry. MG4 X Power. Oh, it's okay. coming through our garage next week. Yep. It sounds awesome on paper. Can't wait to try it out. We will have some video content coming on that, so make sure you subscribe on YouTube for that. Guys, thanks for joining me. Thanks, everyone, for watching. We'll see you in a couple of weeks.